organizers of this meeting for making this possible. Others include Yulish Forsen Centrum, the Human Brain Project, Hybel, which is the Helmholtz International Big Brain Analytics and Learning Laboratory, and Arabic Réseau de Bioimagerie du Québec, and the Neuro, of course, where this is virtually hosted today. So this is our second edition of the Gradients Workshop, but maybe this is your first time actually at the workshop, and maybe you're even new to this field of gradients, you're wondering, what are we talking about? So I can tell you to start off with a gradient in this context means a graded variation in a neuroanatomical feature. Uh, this could be within a region or it could be across the whole brain. And they can also be identified with a lot of different modalities. You see some beautiful examples here from Julie Huttenberg's work of functional connectivity gradients and distance gradients as well. And even though we use many different methods and approaches here, what unites the field is an attempt to understand the spatial patterns of the brain and to better understand this intrinsic coordinate system of the brain. And uh, there's been so much research on this in the past year, there was even a special issue of neuroimage dedicated to gradients. It had 36 articles by my last count. So it really shows it's a booming field. And today is this opportunity for us to get together and share research and discuss it and collectively uncover more about how the brain is organized. Here we go. Okay, so there's three sessions today. Uh, the first session is going to be on bridging scales. Uh, this result revolves around how local or microscopic variations relate to large scale brain organization. Uh, we'll hear from Sukjun, myself, and Sean, and will be chaired by Thomas and Daniel. The next session will be on dynamics. This explores different approaches to modeling the functional dynamics of the brain. We'll hear from Katarina, Kevan, Golia, and Murph, and the chairs will be Beth and Boris. And in the last session of the day, we'll look at Evo Devo. This is where we have presentations on the conservation and divergence of gradients across different species and across the lifespan. We'll hear from Ludovico, uh, Christine, Graham, and our chairs will be Sophie and Richard. So let's have a quick overview of what the day will look like and go through some logistics. So in a moment, I'm going to pass over to Thomas and Daniel, and they'll take care of us in the first session. Each session has three to four talks of 15 minutes. Some have been pre-recorded and some will be live. If there's a couple minutes to spare, then you'll have the chance to ask a quick specifying question. But please do keep broader questions for the end um, of the session because we'll have a longer panel discussion of 45 minutes where you can ask um, questions that might be applicable to multiple speakers and can really bridge across that research theme. Uh, immediately following the first session, we have gradients trigger. Uh, back by popular demand. Uh, at, when the time comes, we'll send out a Google form so you can fill in your answers. It'll be a really quick little competition to see who knows their gradients. And then after that, we'll have time for a coffee break. So you can play trivia, then go grab a coffee. And after that, we'll have session two, where we have four talks and a panel discussion once again. Then we have a longer break, time to go get lunch or dinner or go for a walk outside. And then a third session. And I want to draw your attention to this last part here where we have um, a social gathering and poster session on Wanda. Um, some people may have used Wanda already at other virtual conferences. It's kind of a stripped back version of some of these virtual worlds that you see um, for conferences where it's just a place for us to um, kind of congregate into different um, virtual rooms. And there will be a social gathering and a poster session. So we've already predefined poster rooms. We're doing it a little bit differently to a standard poster session. We've clustered people based on the themes of their posters into groups of like two to four posters. So you'll find that there's different poster rooms with a theme like individual variation or asymmetry. And you can go into that room and would just recommend for the presenters to just take turns sharing their screen and going through their research um, to anyone else in the room. And so that will be both your fellow poster presenters and also onlookers. So hopefully we can invigorate some conversation and it might even be like being in one of those um, corridors of posters at a conference again. So you get to know the people standing next to you as well. So that's the overview of the day. 
Then a little bit of housekeeping is you'll notice that um, all your microphones and videos are kind of slammed shut at the moment on you. Uh, so they'll uh, remain throughout the talks, but in the panel session, we'll automatically change it so that everyone has the option to turn off their video and um, unmute themselves as well. But for the moment, you're all muted and your videos are turned off um, just so um, there's no distractions during the content of the talks. While um, that's occurring, you're welcome to post any questions you have in the chat. So as I said, that each talk um, will have 15 minutes. If the talk goes for say 12 minutes, and maybe we'll have time for one or two questions. So you can post those questions in the chat, but then panel session will open it up a lot more. Uh, we're live streaming on Vimeo as well. Uh, so if uh, your bandwidth doesn't support Zoom for some reason, or if you know someone who hasn't registered, feel free to go and follow on the live stream instead. And um, you can also ask questions even if you're not in the Zoom call via Twitter and you can follow along with proceedings. So we're always posting at, um, at Gradients MTL. Uh, so you can follow along there as well. I think that's all there is for me. And I'm going to hand it off now to Thomas and Daniel. Hi everyone, I'm Thomas. Um, Hi. And my co-host is Daniel. Hi. Hi, Daniel. Very excited to be here. So uh, sh should we just start or? Yeah, go for yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, OK, good. sure. Um, I'm going to start. Um, as, as Casey has already mentioned, there will be three speakers um, for today's session. Um, the first speaker is uh, Seok Jun Hong. Um, he is from oh, Song, Song Kyung Kwan University. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Seok Jun. Uh, in South Korea, um, but he has actually collaborated a lot with actually many people uh, in this uh, workshop, attending this workshop, uh, including, of course, the host. Um, so um, he will give a talk about mapping whole brain spatial temporal dynamics in autism spectrum disorder. So, um, Seok Jun, I guess we will, um, do you need an alarm or something in like 12 minutes or it's fine? Or just let you know in 15 minutes or... I think I, I heard that we I can give a 50 minute talk or sh I can even short, shorten the length of the talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, In that case, go for it then. Um, yeah, if you overshoot okay. it, we'll let you know. Yeah. I'm going to do fast. <laughs> so, anyway. um, do you see my for audience with questions? You can just message in the, uh, the chat. Do you see my screen? Yes. So, yes, I'm Sokjun. Um, thank you for um, invitation, uh, Boris and Casey and our organization committee member. Um, so uh, today, what I'm going to talk about is uh, how we can map the special temporal dynamics in functional brain network in autism spectrum disorder. I think I'm probably the only one who's going to talk about <laughs> clinical samples here. So hopefully it's not so boring. <laughs> um, so for those who... For those who uh, may not be some familiar with this uh, developmental condition, autism spectrum disorder is um, uh, is characterized by many different uh, behavior uh, phenotypes, but uh, as a representative features, they show um, those list of um, phenotypes, uh, including social interaction deficit, communication anomalies, restricted and repeated behaviors with narrow interest, as well as auto sensory sensitivity, as you see in these figures. And then if you see the list of these, um, you, you may realize that um, these, these phenotypes cover quite a wide range of uh, different level of cognitive functions. For instance, these, these first two may be more related to high order cognitive function. These restricted repeated behaviors may be related to both sides, either um, high order cognition or um, uh, low level sensory, um, sensory motor anomalies. The first one is more toward the uh, low level sensory anomalies. So this is quite interesting phenomena in the field that a uh, uh, single entity uh, as a, with the umbrella term with autism still shows this multi-level of cognitive uh, deficits as, as um, leading groups also give the, their opinion on it. Uh, like as Simon Baron Cohen says in his paper, 
that the core occurrence of artistic differences in both low level perceptual behavior and high level social cognitive processing is central puzzle of autism research. So this is an interesting question, but uh, regardless of this, uh, there has been already many different um, uh, neurocognitive or biological theory in autism. As you see in the slide, there are many different theories, but uh, particularly related to this uh, core occurrence of, of both low level and higher level uh, and high level cognitive deficit in autism. I may consider more seriously these two um, weak central coherence and erroneous predictive coding theories. To understand what they are, um, uh, you may have to understand uh, this cortical hierarchy system. We all know that as a human being or even primate brains, uh, we always constantly uh, uh, have to predict uh, what, what we're gonna encounter in the external world. And at the same time, we receive the flooding information uh, of the sensory evidence and we compare these two, make the prediction error and uh, propagate up to the uh, uh, higher hierarchy. So uh, you, you see this um, um, constantly circulating neuronal information processing, which may be probably one of the core mechanism how we can adapt ourselves to this rapidly changing environment. So you can easily imagine if this um, balance is broken, then many behaviors can be affected. In the context of autism, there has been a, a, a really um, big theory that uh, maybe they are related to attenuate precision in prediction process. So they're basically uh, uncertain what they're predicting, which caused this diminished influence of top-down modulation, which again uh, uh, result in this overweighting of local sensory inf information that may uh, account for many different types of behaviors in autism. So as you see this hierarchical system, uh, give a, a big hint to understand this uh, system level pathogenic mechanism in autism. So now, if I talk about more general aspect of this cortical hierarchy, we are all, all excited about this gradient uh, approaches because especially the gradient one shows this uh, large scale cortical hierarchy. Um, and also the, the represent in the figure in Mesunam uh, diagrams. Uh, this gradient one shows this, uh, from the low level to high order um, functional gradients. Not just the hierarchy, but it uh, turns out that the other uh, dim dimensionality reduced component shows uh, cognitively meaningful axis, uh, cro cross, cross modality uh, gradient or task negative to task positive gradients. Uh, as a counterpart, uh, what is more interesting is uh, not just statistic uh, property of cortical hierarchy, but dynamic uh, properties also seems to exist. For instance, this is what uh, the result from uh, what we call the quasi-periodic patterns. I think uh, many of you probably know this technique. Briefly explaining, uh, if you have the uh, lengthy uh, fMRI volume, you randomly select the template, and then you go through the entire length of the volume, calculating the sliding window uh, correlation, and you pick up only those segments showing high correlation and merge them to update the template you go this iterative process uh, performing exactly same analysis until the template is not going to be changed so, so much. And then if you unpack how this template look like, then this is what you can observe. If I play this video, then you can, you can realize that the flow of this global fluctuation just follow the, um, the gradient of the uh, human brain functional network uh, in one, two, three. Uh, so it's not just hierarchy, but other, uh, other um, uh, functional access to. So it sort of uh, give you um, um, special domain of dynamic properties in cortical hierarchy. Um, but then uh, there is also counterpart as a temporal domain uh, in the dynamic properties. There are many uh, dif different domain of evidence uh, claiming that our human brain shows uh, differential uh, time scale across the brain. For instance, this one is uh, monkey electrophysiological evidence. This, this, this one is computational modeling. These are all neuroimaging finding. Uh, and then uh, basically, if you focus on this figure, this is the from the Michael Cole and uh, Ito uh, study, um, uh, saying that uh, if you calculate intrinsic time scale from the resting state of MRI, uh, those sensory primary sensory areas shows a shorter time scale, whereas you go, uh, go higher and higher in the high order areas, they shows have a uh, they have um, uh, longer intrinsic time scales. And basically, you, you, you calculate this uh, temporal autocorrelation function and then measure this uh, time scale uh, of this function. And then you take this value as intrinsic time scale. This is how, how they calculate uh, 
this ITS, in, uh, intrinsic time scale. Um, so this is temporal domain of dynamic properties. Uh, and then this complex pattern of special temporal dynamics seems to reflect the principle of large scale cortical uh, hierarchy scheme. But what about in autism? Um, how are these hierarchy related uh, dynamics affected in, in these developmental conditions? And I was so much excited uh, that I'm going to perform uh, this intrinsic time scale analysis or QPP analysis in autism then guess what, uh, what, what it turns out that the, when I, whenever I came up with the idea, it means there's already a study is published. So I found this paper from Japanese group that um, uh, this is really beautiful study, uh, it's published in eLife, uh, where they calculate um, this uh, intrinsic time scale in, in typical, typically developing brain in autism. And this is this just profile of the intrinsic time scale. And then they, when they um, statistically compare this time scale, they, they found a specific area showing uh, a group difference. Uh, for instance, this uh, uh, post central gyrus and occipital lobe, but also tendency of in high order areas, which again um, are, are associated to um, um, uh, major um, symptom severity in autism. So it's quite uh, interesting finding. Um, but then I also uh, found some a little bit of caveat of this study that uh, this study was based on the small sample size, like um, around 25 subjects. Even for the independent study, uh, had, in independent data that they used also has like a 19 subjects. And then they mainly focus on high functioning of autism. Then what is what, what was the really pity was they never really uh, uh, say anything about this un potential underlying mechanistic factors. So there was uh, what I what I wanted to see from this study, and then again the temporal domain is only uh, aspect that they study, and they didn't really uh, show special uh, aspect of this um, dynamics, uh, like in, in functional signal flow. So we conducted a recent uh, uh, recently we conducted one study. Uh, this is the PhD student in my lab that uh, they, we took the large sample data set um, and uh, like 306 individuals and then uh, analyzed resting state functional MRI. And then we combined three different approaches, intrinsic time scale, quasi-periodic patterns and computational modeling. So I'm gonna show you uh, one by one for the new finding, but uh, bear in mind that this, this is still ongoing project. So there must be some uh, findings that look quite incomplete. So but then you can always give me feedbacks or comments for that. So this is intrinsic time scale that we calculated. Uh, as you see, uh, both controls and autism shows um, uh, generally uh, normal looking patterns like um, those uh, sen somatosensory areas that have a, a lower, a shorter time scale. Whereas if you go further to DMN or high order areas, they have a longer time scales. But when you directly compare between the two groups that we found um, specific areas that shows the group difference, uh, this motor area and then a visual area, a sensory area in uh, visual cortex and the, the frontal areas. Uh, and then um, it was quite interesting to see that we kind of replicated the, the Japanese group's findings that, uh, for instance, this post central gyrus and occipital lobe and also tendency in the, in the frontal lobes. We also um, further going to checking the, the uh, region focused hierarchical profile. So we picked up uh, several uh, sensory and frontal areas. And then uh, we sort out uh, this intrinsic time scale across this uh, known hierarchy. As you see, they are not perfectly uh, follow the, the, and they increase the, along the hierarchy, but more or less uh, they show increasing patterns uh, as you go further higher hierarchy. And then um, in, in uh, sensory areas, again, in, within this area, uh, they show uh, either a reduced um, time scale or longer time scale in front of them. So it's also quite um, consistent finding. Uh, we also now check the special domain of um, a dynamic aspect using these quasi-periodic patterns. And then uh, you can focus on this uh, from the 14 second to 15 second because the, the other extremes are either um, continue from the past or next uh, QPP pattern. So this, this is a, a, a one segment of QPP. And then um, as the uh, uh, Shella's uh, recent study, uh, as you see these, uh, these patterns, it starts from this motor and, and then visuals, and then uh, it goes to the DMN. So you, you can imagine how this uh, 
functional flow is going on over the whole brain. And then when we compare between the two groups in terms of uh, the activity strengths, then this early period where this uh, sensory area activation time, uh, the, the autism shows rather decreased activity strengths. But then as you, as you go further to high order areas, like in this middle time or later time, they show rather um, excessively larger uh, activity strengths in QPP. We also checked the time to pick uh, to, to, to uh, understand uh, the special temporal dynamics. And it turns out that uh, these sensory, uh, the, the sensory areas uh, shows rather um, uh, uh, longer time to make the peak response in autism, whereas in, um, in DMN, it shows rather shorter uh, time to uh, make the maximum response of the QPP in autism. Um, finally, we perform this computational modeling. Uh, again, as I put in the title, it is ongoing work. This is, it turns out that this computational modeling has this devil in the details. So we really play around many things, uh, checking the parameters now. But here, uh, at, as a first model, we took the Domitus uh, uh, 2019 neuron model, um, where uh, uh, based on this structural connectivity, uh, we built uh, the neural math model um, uh, ha having these uh, few um, biophysical parameter uh, ex recurrent excitatory connectivity, excitatory to inhibitory connectivity. And then uh, based on this computational model, we simulate the signal, neural signals and convert to the bolts and then uh, calculate the functional connectivity and uh, iteratively comparing to actual experimental uh, connectivity map to tweak the parameters to minimize the difference between experimental and uh, simulation. Um, we initially wanted to uh, make the individualized model, but uh, turns out that because of this noise data, we could not really make the reliable um, uh, performance so that we took rather bootstrapping based subsample group level approaches where we perform 100 bootstraps. And these, these, these are were the three parameters. Um, I'm not gonna go to detail because of time, short time, but uh, we basically targeted this excitatory, excitatory connectivity and excitatory inhibitory connectivity. We uh, could achieve the, like a moderate um, uh, correlation between experimental and simulated functional connectivity. And then based on these uh, parameters, uh, when we profile these by physical parameters, then uh, interestingly, um, those uh, somato sen uh, the low level sensory areas uh, shows or, uh, increased uh, uh, excitatory, excitatory and low level sensory areas. Uh, whereas if, as you go further, it doesn't make the um, uh, increase uh, WEE, the excitatory, excitatory, uh, but uh, in, in excitatory inhibitory uh, connectivity is, was rather decreased. So the, in the end, when we calculate the ratio between this EE and EI uh, across the whole brain is constantly shows this increased excitatory components. Um, we are um, um, uh, trying to evaluate the relationship between this computational modeling parameters and intrinsic time scale by simulating the signals. But we, we haven't uh, done fin uh, finished yet this uh, analysis, so it's an on ongoing project. So finally, to summarize, um, atypical cortical hierarchy may underlie various behavior phenotypes of ASD as a system level mechanism. The current study focused on spatial temporal dynamics related to this hierarchical system uh, using multimodal, uh, multi-method approaches like intrinsic time scale, QPP, and uh, modeling approaches. In autism, um, intrinsic time scale show, uh, was shorter in low level sensory, but longer in high order transmodal system. QPP was reduced, uh, shows a reduced brain signal flow in early period where uh, the sensory was sensory area was maximally activated, but uh, increased in the later time. Uh, I, uh, both DMN and, and frontal parietal network uh, was maximally activated. activated. So uh, it's a purely speculation, but uh, globally increased excitation uh, across the brain may be related to this atypical special temporal dynamics in AST, which is uh, the, the, the hypothesis that we have to check in later. So this is the end of my talk and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sok Jung. This is a um, very interesting talk, um, very exciting work. Um, I think we're running short on time. So does anyone have a quick question you want to ask? I think one of the audience member asked you whether um, you've already published, a, uh, is this already published? 
I think the you say that this is work in progress, right? Yeah, no, it's it's far from the code. <laughs> One quick question I have is that um, if, can you go back to your slide of the about the intrinsic time scale? Um, I was kind of surprised to see that the um, like the dorsal tension seems to have a relatively long time scale, maybe even longer than prefrontal cortex. Um, and I, I thought that like you know the 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 prefrontal uh, regions should have perhaps longer right. intrinsic. I'm skill. Um, yeah. Really? Is this consistent uh, with the other literature? Um, I think the, it's probably related to the reliability of the signal per se. And this is from a byte data set, which is five minutes. So we're really suffering from the, the not, being able, not being fully able to replicate it. The, the other studies like Ito or Watanabe studies, uh, where they should beautifully this uh, hierarchical changing of the intrinsic time scale. But as you point out, uh, there are some specific areas looking quite uh, weird, but uh, this is what we have now. And then um, we, 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 we still check uh, what kind of signal properties make this um, unexpected uh, intrinsic time scale values. So. Cool. Um, I guess let's, let us move on to the... Um, the next speaker. Um, if other people have questions about postdoc Jun, uh, we can do it um, at the end of this session. We have actually have like 45 minutes of discussion time. Okay, so for the next speaker, uh, we have um, Casey. Um, oh, I realized that I don't know how to put Pecola. Yes, um, oh, she's currently okay. in uh, your pardon? Yeah, that was good, Pecola. I didn't know how to pronounce it. You can pronounce it any way you like. Um, she's currently at uh, Ulich, uh, Germany, and um, she's, of course, uh, one of the organizers of this uh, workshop. Um, so she, she does not need further introduction. So um, she's going to talk about uh, the machine in the ghost, cyto architecture and wiring of the default mode network. Go for it, um, Casey. Thanks, Thomas. Yeah, so I want to talk about the machine in the ghost, where the machine is the neuronal architecture and the ghost is that mystical default mode. Okay, let's get started. So I think it's quite interesting to start off by thinking about how the conceptualization of the default mode has changed over the past 20 years. It was first described as this task negative network and you often read about it being offline mode of the brain, but that was subsequently challenged by a lot of research showing it was enhanced activity during tasks that draw on memory, such as um, context dependent um, decision-making or narrative comprehension or social cognition. So several contemporary theories start to postulate that the default mode is actually really important to balance integration of information from external and internal sources. So you see from this really lovely review by Yuri Hasson's group that came out recently, the default mode in this intermediary position brings in a lot of extrinsic information and incorporates that with prior knowledge of the world from long-term memory. And it's thought that that enables the formation of a rich context-dependent model of a situation as it unfolds in time. So that's primarily based on task fMRI. But in the resting state literature, we tend to see the default mode conceptualized as the apex of a processing hierarchy. So for example, stepwise functional connectivity, if seated in primary sensory areas, it progresses towards the default mode and then achieves a new stable state. And also the principal axis of differentiation in resting state functional connectivity runs from um, primary sensory areas and more purple colors all the way to the red default mode. Um, so again, emphasizing a default mode as an extreme opposition to primary sensory areas. And my favorite analysis from this paper, though, is that the peaks of the gradient are maximally distant from primary sensory areas when you look at distance along the cortex. So it really shows this separation of the default mode from um, primary sensory input. So we really set out to test these hypotheses and fundamentally provide a richer neuroanatomical characterization of the default mode, which seems to be quite lacking in the literature up until now. Okay, so first, what is the default mode made of? Uh, we started by looking at the composition of the default mode with respect to cortical type. 
Uh, these were first defined by Von Economo and recently reanalyzed by Garcia Cerveza et al. We were particularly interested in these types because they index the sensory fuel hierarchy that was described by Meslum here. So here you can see that the different um, types based on cytoarchitecture, there's a, a few different cytoarchitectural features that change as well. The most prominent is the granularity. So that's the prominence of layer four and it disappears at eight granular. So here we're going conica cortical, you laminate three, two, one, disgranular, a granular. I'll keep the order the same the whole time. So you can just think of cortical types by decreasing granularity. But there's other features of cytoarchitecture that change as well. And if we look at this in the schema of Meslem, theoretically, this is synonymous with going from primary sensory on the outer ring to unimodal, heteromodal, then paralimbic and limbic. So this provides a cytoarchitectural proxy for proximity to either the external world or internal milieu. So in the DMN, if we look at an overlap of these maps, we find that conica cortex, through this um, kind of primary sensory type, is almost non-existent in the default mode. And this might just be due to like a mismatch of the group level atlases that we're using. I would expect this small proportion of conica cortex actually disappears if you had single subject maps, but that's a, a challenge for another day. Uh, but there's a decent representation of the other cortical types throughout the default mode, though. And if we compare the proportions to the rest of the cortex, we see that the default mode has an over-representation of the laminate one. See that all the different types have different proportions overall, but this is over-represented in the default mode, which does fit with the typical idea of the default mode as heteromodal. But I think this makes us um, rethink how networks are um, composed a little bit because it shows that there's a wide range of cytoarchitectural types nested within the default mode. And the cytoarchitectural variability is more nuanced than cortical types as well. So we map cytoarchitectural variation within the default mode by measuring intracortical variations in cell body staining from big brain. Uh, big brain is a high resolution volumetric reconstruction of an entire post-mortem human brain. We took a total of 62,000 staining intensity profiles. These are oriented in the direction of cortical columns. They run from peel to white matter, and they index variations in cellular density and soma size as you increase depth within the cortex. So you see these blue lines have very high density um, in these deeper layers, whereas the red lines are more flat. And these are all taken from within the default mode. We correlate these profiles to um, calculate microstructure profile covariance, and then we apply diffusion map embedding to extract the principal axis of variation in cytoarchitecture. architecture. This is the first eigenvector. It explains 42% of variance um, approximately in the default mode, and it illustrates what we've come to think of as an outside-in pattern of cytoarchitectural differentiation. So we call it outside in because you notice there's a lot of local gradients that run towards the limbus. Let's have a look at the medial parietal area, for example. It goes from blue to red, from posterior to anterior. But if we flip it and we look at the frontal cortex, um, we actually see that the gradient goes from anterior to posterior. So the increases seem to be going inwards. You can also see this really nicely um, in parahippocampal gyrus that the gradient value increases as you move in towards the hippocampus. And so this um, outside in refers to outside in towards the limbus. And the limbus here is defined as the edge between the cerebral hemispheres and the diencephalon. So the outside in gradient is um, distinct in how it represents the association cortex relative to the sensory fugal hierarchy. So here we have the gradient values for each type um, within the default mode. So if we expected that the outside ingredient is parallel to sensory fugal hierarchy of these cortical types, we'd expect a diagonal here. But we do get similar anchors. It seems that the sensory fugal hierarchy extends all the way from conical cortex to a granular, whereas the default mode is a little bit more restricted, but it abuts to those ends as well. But it has a very different representation of your laminate uh, 321 and disgranular. So I think it's important to point out that these two gradients are not parallel, but they're also not orthogonal. Okay, then, so overall, just from this cytoarchitectural picture, we've learned that the DMN is heterogeneous and it's organized along an outside ingredient. 
relative to other networks, we also find that um, many other networks, sorry, they have a variety of cortical types as well. So this is just a, a quick overview of the fact that all the networks have multiple cortical types in them. The default mode um, has a distinct distribution, though. It's most similar to ventral attention network. If we look at big brain, though, where we can really um, evaluate heterogeneity, we see that um, the default mode does have the highest level of cytoarchitectural um, heterogeneity compared to the other functional networks. They're closely followed by a ventral attention network as well. So maybe something funny is going on in there. So next, we want to keep building up this neuroanatomical characterization of the default mode in terms of its intrinsic architecture, as well as regional differences in its extrinsic connectivity. We already know that the default mode occupies this unique position in the cortical mantle. So we want to ask how the topography influences regional differences in connectivity of the default mode to the rest of the brain. To do so, we combine diffusion-based tractography with distance to calculate navigation efficiency between 400 parcels across the cortex. I think not only does navigation efficiency like, um, elegantly fuse distance and tractography, but there's also research showing that it closely approximates invasive tract tracing connectomes in non-human primates. So it seems to be well suited to map low cost wiring in the brain. Then returning to our question of um, communication of the default mode to external versus internal sources, so whether it's um, more um, predispensed to communicate with um, sensory areas or more limbic areas, we look at navigation efficiency to each cortical type. And if you look at the other networks, you see there's an imbalance or some preferences in which cortical types they have stronger navigation efficiency to. Limbic is quite obvious, very high navigation efficiency relative to discranular areas compared to other cortical types. But the default mode has this type of balance that we don't see in other networks. And compared to null models where we set up a homogeneous balance, we find that only the default mode really matches this null model in terms of its balance in communication to all these different cortical types. So it seems that there's a potential of the default mode to equally communicate across the sensory cubal hierarchy. When we tested whether the cytoarchitectural gradient contributes to this balance, the average navigation efficiency decreases along the gradient. So the outside aspect of the default mode has higher navigation efficiency to everywhere on average, whereas the inside aspect has lower navigation efficiency, it's closer to the limbus, it seems a little bit more insulated. And this effect was especially driven by more granular types. So the outside aspect has especially heightened navigation efficiency to more externally focused areas. And in essence, this shows that extrinsic connectivity of the default mode is also organized along the outside in gradient. Okay, so the structural manifold of the DMN demonstrates the potential for equipoised communication across the sensory cubal hierarchy. But understanding this, how this potential is actualized really requires an examination of ongoing fluctuations in brain activity. So to do so, we modeled the effective connectivity using resting state fMRI and regression dynamic causal modeling. So RDCM is a highly scalable generative model of effective connectivity. It was developed by collaborator Stefan Fressler, and it lets us inspect the directed signal flow throughout the entire brain. So first we look at the type effect again, and we find this balance is present in the efferent connectivity, so DMN sending information to the rest of the brain, but not so in afferent connectivity, where there are preferences to certain types in terms of the incoming information of the default mode. So we see that the DMN can broadcast widely across the sensory fugal hierarchy. And then we look at the gradient effect, and we find that average afferent connectivity decreases from outside in, but we don't see such an association for efferent connectivity. So negative correlation in the afferent connectivity in mirrors what we saw in the navigation efficiency. So again, showing that this inside aspect of the default mode seems to be relatively insulated from input. Also, unlike the navigation efficiency though, we did not observe a type by gradient interaction for the afferent connectivity. So combining the fMRI derived afferent connectivity results with the navigation efficiency results, we would hypothesize that the outside aspect receives the majority of input of the DMN from many different cortical types, but based on this navigation efficiency, it seems that more granular types may have higher fidelity or faster communication to the default. 
So I think our description of DMN's neural architecture sets us up to try to formulate a theory on what information enters the default mode and what the default mode does with that information. So input for the to the default mode is organized along this outside in gradient. So let me orient you a little bit here. We're going to put everything that's not default mode into this little bar plot. And then the default mode is represented by different points, the different regions in the default mode, and it's organized by outside ingredient and then navigation efficiency to primary sensory areas. So something like the insulation of an area as well. So we see that if we look at the top 5% of afferent connectivity, it comes from a few different cortical types, but it really converges largely upon um, a subset of the default mode, leaving this section relatively insulated from input, as I was mentioning before. I think this zone of convergence is quite interesting. It definitely fits with this idea of the um, default mode having many hub regions as well. And I think the convergence, because it's collecting information from across the centrifugal hierarchy, it can allow for this unique recombination of information that then kind of lights the fire of um, communication within the default mode. Because we know that there's really um, dense communication in the default mode based on functional coactivations, as well as a long range structural connectivity that's costly, it's um, being used in the default mode. And so the variety of cytal architecture in the default mode tells us that as information is moving through the default mode, it has to constantly be transformed. And I think it would change dimensionality and it's reconstructed. So we put forward that the default mode reconstructs information in a distinctive manner that's not enabled by the um, directed flow along the sensory fugal processing streams. And then finally, we see that the default mode really widely broadcasts this information back across the sensory fugal hierarchy, speaking to its potential to shape our predictions and expectations at many different levels. Okay, with that, I'll wrap up and say thank you. Um, especially, well, thank you to everyone who's um, supported this project, but especially uh, Margie Gava, who started this project when she was rotating through the lab as a PhD student, and Stefan for always being helpful with uh, anything DCM related. And of course, Boris, because uh, we've been having a lot of fun discussing everything to do with the default mode. And if you're interested in combining cytoarchitecture and histology with neuroimaging, I'll direct you to Big Brain Wolf as well, where we have a lot of code and data and tutorials to help you do projects like this. Thanks. Thanks for this um, excellent talk, um, Casey. Very intriguing. Um, is, is, I think we have, um, we, we have time for a question, maybe a question or two. Anyone? If not, um, I can ask my own question. So, um, Casey, um, in this study, you're actually relating um, the, the DMN to the, um, the big brain, like, um, cytoarchitecture, right? I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you have also, now that you're at Eulich, have you also uh, looked at the other, the other cytoarchitectonic atlases with, um, yeah. yeah, and how, how does that relate? Yeah, I haven't looked at the other side of tectonic atlases yet. One problem at the moment is being able to do transformations to any of the other brains, for example. Um, and so in terms of moving to individual brains, it's still quite a challenge, but there are um, like the next generations of big brain are being sliced and scanned at the moment. So I think it's kind of a future project, but relating it to previously um, constructed brains, the transformations just haven't um, been fully worked out yet. In terms of, for example, the Eulish Brain Atlas, which um, was just published um, earlier this year, I believe, at the moment that is really um, well constructed for many regions, but not for the regions of the default mode. There's a huge gap map mm -hmm. for the frontal cortex, for example. So I think that the established cytoarchitectural areas sometimes um, aren't well characterized enough for the areas that are very predominant in the default mode. But I think that looking at individual variability is something I'd love to do, and hopefully we could get there with quantitative T1 as well. I realize that two people have raised their hands. Uh, why don't we just answer that the two people's question and then we move on? Yeah, um, I was trying and, to quick. Yeah, Ni Nicola, um, do you want to go ahead? She may not be up to. Oh, to she answer. needs to unmute. We we need um okay um. I see us to unmute. Right, thank so you. Now I'm unmuted. Thank you very much. 
Um, yes, lovely please. talk, Casey. Really, really interesting. Um, I, I've got a question concerning how you identified the areas in the big brain. So, um, mm. did you pass it? It's just or? Yeah, no, it's just based on transformation of the group average functional networks onto big brain. So there's right. not really any specialization for big brain. I think that's why there might be some misalignment, I think, still in terms of okay. like what would the default mode really look like in big brain? We don't. Right. And, and also, you don't know exactly how many cytokatectonically distinct areas are located within each one of the uh, default mode hubs or right no not fully as i haven't really investigated much further because of the huge gap maps that i know are going to be there for frontal cortex but i think in other areas like uh, the parietal areas we could definitely test that out yeah no it's just because for example um the one that you showed the the on the medial surface the posterior cingulate cortex yeah. you've got lovely gradient from posterior to anterior, which mostly or covers a lot of, of Brodmann's area 23 or, or mm -hmm. for area LC. And um, that change in that, that gradient that you see is, is uh, it reflects differences in site architecture. So, yeah. uh, so the part that, for example, that is red in, in your gradient that would, uh, would be most probably disgranular portion of Brotman's area 23. Yeah, it's it's nice validation to know that as well, that even though this is a purely data-driven method, that we do mm -hmm. see a, quite a good alignment with what our expectations would be based on the areas as well. Even if it is like data-driven ingredients, we see that there's suddenly a, a sharper change exactly where we'd expect that shift yes. to LC. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah definitely it's, a, a good it's just because it's it's an area that I'm mapping at the moment, so that's oh. why <laughs> it drew my attention. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Very much. No, thanks, Nicola. Okay. Um, uh, I can Boris. maybe ask, yeah, yeah, Casey, beautiful talk, and the work is, is amazing, obviously. Um, I just have like one question for the heterogeneity in the DMN with respect to cyber architecture while you were presenting this. Yeah. Um, would you expect that? I mean, this is like the, the, and I think like in some of the previous questions, it also came up a little bit. Would you expect that intra-subject variability um, plays a role also for, say, if you take something that's like functionally really consistent across subjects, would you then expect less site architecture variability or the same amount? Or is there like a way to quantify this? Mm. Well, maybe I'm not quite going to answer the question, but I think when we're looking at the level of networks, we should always expect heterogeneity. Like, I think it should be a defining feature of a network that there has to be variation in cytoarchitecture. architecture. So I don't think the heterogeneity would go away if we refined the map, for example. Mm -hmm. But just, I don't think I fully answered your question. Maybe. I mean, that's maybe also like a question to the functional folks out there, whether, you know, if, uh, we use the the EU the, the EU map of the DMN, but there's possibly like a, a specifier that is kind of like a probabilistic version of it, like how how robust it is across subjects, and then what could just vary this across individuals, the DMN definition, and see whether this heterogeneity relationship with the site architecture still holds. So um. Ruby has um, done some work on um, estimating these uh, networks and individual subjects. And as a result, she also maps, for example, the how variables are the different networks. So in general, we find that the sensory motor networks are less spatially variable across subjects, uh, whereas the association networks are more variable. I, I actually cannot remember for the uh, default network whether it's in between or is actually the most variable. So, yeah. But I guess, um, Boris, I, I think what you're saying is that um, if you have this variability um, across subjects, so when Casey map it to the uh, site to architecture, mm -hmm. like there, there'll be greater align misalignment for um, these networks that are more spatially variable. Is that right? Yeah, or in other words, whether we can have something that's like 
100% DMN in all subjects, 90% uh, DMN in all subjects, 80% DMN in all subjects. You know that, that we kind of probabilistically specify where the DMN is situated and then just use maybe a cons more conservative mm -hmm. definition of the DMN. It sounds like we could be using Ruby, like if we mm -hmm. have many different networks, we could be like, well, imagine if the big brain has this, was this person yeah. and run it like that as well. Um, yeah, I think yeah, the individual okay. variability is difficult to get around with big brain at the moment. But, um, um, so, so Ruby has already put those networks up. So if you all want, oh. you can uh, easily yeah. just download them and average it yourself to, to get this probability map. Yeah. So if you have any issues, just email me. Yeah. Just email us. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so Daniel, you want to do the last speaker? Let's do it. Yeah. Thanks, Thomas. Casey, beautiful work as always. Um, it's been a real treat. And to wrap up the uh, session on scales and gradients, uh, we have a talk by uh, Sean Frodis Walsh, who's currently at New York University, uh, working in as a postdoc in Xiaoxing Wang's lab on dynamical models primarily. And he comes from a background uh, investigating neuromodulators and uh, networks involved in uh, memory in humans and non-human primates. And we'll be giving a talk today on gradients of receptor expression in the macaque cortex. We're really excited to hear about it. So Sean, take away. Um, I don't hear any sound yeah. <laughs> myself. Uh, Sasha, could you unmute the recording, please? Hi, I'm Sean. Ah, there we go. And I'm a postdoc in Shaijin Wang's lab in New York University. Today I'm going to speak to you about our recent work, Gradients of Receptor Expression in the Macaque Cortex, that is part of an ongoing collaboration with Nicola Palomara Gallagher and her wonderful anatomy group in Ulip in Germany, as well as with Ting Shu and Daniel Margulies. The mapping of the connectome across species is one of the major recent achievements of neuroscience. However, connectivity alone is insufficient to explain neurocircuit dynamics underlying brain functions, as these also depend on the neurotransmitters and receptors used for communication between neurons. Bearing this in mind, Nicola and her team in ULIP used in vitro receptor autoradiography to measure the density of 14 receptor types across 109 areas of the macaque cortex. We aim to analyze the principal patterns of receptor variation across the cortex and to understand them in relationship to the large scale anatomical and functional organization of the cortex. After they had measured the density of these receptors across many different slices, we mapped their in vitro data onto the cortical surface. This allowed us to project the densities of three types of glutamatergic receptors, three types of inhibitory GABAergic receptors, and eight types of neuromodulatory receptors onto the cortex. Now, this is quite a lot of information. So to simplify the complexity somewhat, we performed a principal components analysis, or PCA. The first principal component shown here, which we call the principal receptor gradient, accounted for most of the variance in the receptor data, with the top five components accounting for 95%. We can then project each cortical area into a 2D space defined by the first two principal components, which we call the receptor space. We can recognize that anatomical and perhaps functionally related areas, such as the visual areas here, tend to cluster together in receptor space, indicating that they tend to have a similar receptor expression. Let's now look at receptor expression in different cortical areas along PC1. Here we show the receptor fingerprint in area V1, where a higher receptor density corresponds to the colored bar being closer to the edge. As we pick areas that are progressively further along the first principal component, we see that the expression of most receptors increases. This led us to believe that perhaps the first principal component was simply encoding the total number of receptors per neuron. Indeed, we saw that the, the principal receptor gradient explained 99% of the variance in the total receptor density across the cortex. We also see that areas near the top of the receptor gradient express about four times as many receptors per neuron as areas near the bottom. 
So receptor density per neuron increases fourfold along the principal gradient. We then look to compare the receptor expression to other anatomical. First, we analyzed the retrograde track tracing data of Henry Kennedy and colleagues. We estimated the cortical hierarchy by examining the pattern of laminar connections between pairs of regions across the cortex. The hierarchy, estimated in this way, was strongly positively correlated with the receptor gradient. Putting this together with this previous information suggests that areas that are low in the hierarchy, such as neurons and sensory areas, have relatively few receptors. However, how might neurons that are higher in the hierarchy be able to hold more receptors? To examine this, we collated data from a series of studies by Guy Alston and colleagues, where they measured the area of the dendritic tree. We found that the size of the dendritic tree of uh, basal dendrites and pyramidal neurons increased systematically along the, along the principal receptor gradient. So neurons in areas near the top of the hierarchy may grow large dendrites, which may allow them to house more receptors. Myelin has been shown to inhibit the creation of new synaptic connections. The ratio of the T1-weighted to the T2-weighted scan has been proposed, not without controversy, as a potential marker of cortical myelin. We found a strong negative correlation between the receptor gradient and the T1 and T2 signal. We decided to investigate the relationship between receptor density and myelin further by looking across layers within an in vitro slice of V1. Here we see that myelin peaks in layer 6B deep in the cortex and has a second peak in layer 4B. And it's also generally higher in the deep layers compared to the superficial layers. Although there is some variation across the receptors, generally they tend to follow an opposite pattern with dips in layer 6B and 4B, and generally higher receptor expression in the superficial compared to the deep layers. So our analysis suggests an inverse relationship between the receptor density and myelin across cortical layers, and perhaps also cortical areas. Ting Shu recently built on Diana Marvini's discovery of gradients of functional connectivity in the cortex. And she and her colleagues defined joint gradients of functional connectivity across the human and macaque cortex. Here we found that the first two gradients of functional connectivity were significantly correlated with the primary receptor gradient. This suggests that variation in receptor expression may also shape in vivo interactions between cortical areas. We then used Ting Shu's cross species functional alignment technique to map classical resting state networks from the human onto the macaque cortex. Here, if we look at the first principal component of the receptor data, we see that the sensory networks and the higher cognitive networks are clearly separated along this principal component, such that the visual and the motor network has significantly lower receptor density than the four higher cognitive networks. Our analysis so far has been focused on the first principal component which is a marker of the total receptor density per neuron. But we were also interested in the differences in the patterns of receptors expressed across cortical areas. Here we see that the second principal component is mostly driven by differences in the expression of the serotonin 5-HT1A receptor. This component also clearly separates canonical resting state networks with a very low 5-HT1A expression in the dorsal attention network and high expression the default mode network and the salience network. So a distinct serotonin receptor expression between higher cognitive networks drives the second principal component. To investigate the relationship between our results in the macaque brain and those in the human brain, we first mapped the gene expression for the 5-HT1A receptor from the Allen human brain atlas onto the human cortex. Then using Ting's cross-species functional alignment technique, we translated this onto the macaque cortex. This allowed us to compare it with 5-HT1A receptor expression, and despite the differences in techniques and species, there was a strong positive correlation between human 5-HT1A gene expression and macaque 5-HT1A receptor expression. Furthermore, the human gene expression and macaque receptor expression 
mapped onto resting state networks in an extremely similar way. Using receptor odor radiography, we also found that there was a strong relationship between the macaque expression and human uh, receptor expression across cortical areas, and also to a lesser extent with the rat. For the last two slides, I'm going to give you a little hint of related work that we've been doing. In this work, with the research worker called Elise Klausman, we examined the NMDA and AMPA receptor expression across the cortex. Given that AMPA is much faster than NMDA, it's usually thought that AMPA receptors should dominate the sensory cortex, whereas NMDA receptors, which are thought to contribute to working memory, should dominate in higher hierarchical areas. However, when we analyzed the macaque data, we found that the fraction of NMDA receptors actually decreases along the cortical hierarchy. Now, a similar result has been found recently in the human cortex by Nicola Palomero Gallagher and Alex Goulos and colleagues. We then built a large scale model of the cortex that matched these NMDA and AMPA ratios. This was driven by long range feedback connections, mostly being onto NMDA receptors and long-range feed-forward connections being mostly targeting AMPA receptors. We found that this somewhat counterintuitive NMDA AMPA gradient was actually critical for realistic fast propagation of sensory information from sensory areas to the prefrontal cortex in a time that matches the signatures of ignition and experiments of access of stimuli to consciousness. Whereas models that have the NMDA and feed-forward receptors took far too long to propagate the stimuli to the cortex. In another recent modeling work, we examined how dopamine D1 receptors and long range connectivity determine distributed working memory activity and performance. We showed that lesions to regions with a greater D1 receptor density cause a greater disruption of working memory activity. And this model replicates many findings from the working memory literature such as the distributed pattern of activity across the cortex, the inverted U response to dopamine, and increased resistance to distraction with dopamine stimulation. So to conclude, we found a principal gradient of receptor expression that increases along the cortical hierarchy. Brain regions with more receptors also tend to contain neurons with larger dendrites and less myelin. We also found that higher cognitive networks are distinguished by the pattern of serotonin receptor expression. So with that, I want to say thank you very much for listening. And also thank collaborators and funders. And thanks very much to the organizers of this workshop. Hi. Fantastic. Thanks so much, John. Hey there. Yeah. Hey, hey, yeah, so I, I am here. I am actually in a Florida hotel right now, which is why I pre-recorded the talk. So if my um, connection drops, uh, well, I guess we'll just do our best. But I'm happy to take any questions now quickly if there are, or else maybe we can go straight into the um, group discussion. Fantastic. Are, are there any uh, questions for, for Sean? No, please. Great. Oh, uh, Sukjan. Yeah, Sean. Thanks so much for a great talk. This is a beautiful study. Um, uh, there are many shocking results for me. So there are many, there could be many questions, but if I pick up one question, uh, when you show me the, when you show, show us the clear, um, uh, you, you clearly distinguish between the salience and the different mode versus the others, right? Um, to me, it remind me that uh, what is the role of the salience network? So because we tend to believe that this default mode network is really um, far from the external world and they try to internal model. And then what, what do you think, what, what do you have as a, for the opinion that what is the role of the salience, uh, w w whether this is similar to, is there any function similar to default mode network or, yeah. Yeah, so this is something that um, we're kind of starting to explore now, uh, maybe with a, you know, like a large scale dynamical model and trying to think about why, why do we see this pattern of serotonin 5-HT1A receptor expression there? And this is mostly um, tends to have an inhibitory effect. Um, and we actually kind of see, if anything, an opposite 
uh, serotonin receptor expression pattern in the dorsal attention network, where we see a greater predominance of the 5-HT2 serotonin receptor, which is more kind of excitatory. So uh, what I think now is that perhaps um, when you get serotonin expression, it might serve to actually inhibit the default mode network. And if you get a lot so that it excites the, it engages the 5-HT2 receptors, you might also excite the dorsal attention network. And, and the way I'm kind of thinking about this is that these two large scale networks are maybe kind of in, in competition with each other. Um, and, and that serotonin can release can kind of just tip the balance perhaps in favor of the dorsal attention network. And, and I think that's kind of consistent with some results that serotonin release is um it happens in kind of surprising situations now what the salience network itself does in that situation is something that i really want to explore in this large-scale model that we're kind of not there yet but i i think it might just kind of help um bias this competition between these two other large-scale networks but of course we have a, a lot of experts on networks here today so i'd love to hear other people's ideas too so I can steal them. <laughs> no. um, yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Other uh, other questions? I think at this point the panel discussion has naturally begun. So feel free to jump in. Yeah, Sean, there are... there... go ahead. Okay. Thomas. There's some questions in the in the chat. Um, um, Daniel is asking, um, still thinking about layer dependency. It is to my understanding that, oh, sorry. So just now while you were talk, while you were playing a video, I don't know if you saw the question whereby someone was asking you how you handle the, um, the fact that there's layer dependency in the, um, in the gene express, uh, sorry, in the receptor, um, ex expression. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. Um, I think maybe Nicola briefly touched on this. So I think as, as you'll understand, right? So this is a uh, 14 receptors across 109 regions. And then we were trying to link it with fMRI data and myelin data and so on. So at, at the beginning, we're kind of ignoring the layer information for the moment, but this is not our, our plan. We want to really uh, integrate this both in the analysis and the modeling uh, going forward. We've already done some, some preliminary layer dependent modeling. Uh, but this is really work that I think is going to be developed um, uh, mature, uh, mature uh, more in the next couple of years. So there's a postdoc working with Nicola Palamero Gallagher called Thomas Funk, who is really working on the 3D reconstruction of the receptor, all of the receptor data in the human and the macaque. And uh, once I guess his work is finished, we're going to have a lot more flexibility in terms of analyzing the, the layer dependence. Um, and and many other analyses. So I agree that it's important. Uh, and I would say that we're just kind of quite, not quite there yet in terms of even extracting uh, all of the, the layer data for all the receptors, I think, yeah, thanks. Cool. Um, yeah, so um, let's see. Um, Alexis is asking, could you please point me to the data set uh, you used to perform alignment between humans and primates? Oh, by the way, if if people want to just ask a question instead of just messaging, feel free to raise your hand and, and we can uh, unmute you. Raise your hand in, in the Zoom way, not, I mean, your videos are off, so we cannot see you raise your hand. We cannot yeah. see you raise your physical hands, yeah. So I don't know, um, if, sorry. Did you want me to answer something? Oh, sure. Um, Point me to the data set you use to perform alignment between humans and primates. Yeah, right. that's what. So, so this is using, um, I don't know if Ting is here, but Ting shoes. A uh, really wonderful cross species functional alignment technique. And she used uh, the, I think, principally the human connectome project data and uh, open data from the prime DRE uh, non human primate uh, neuroimaging collaboration. And uh, I'd really recommend anybody who's interested. I know there's a lot of expert neuroimagers here, but maybe not as many people have worked with non human primate data. And um, uh, you know, we have had a very small role, but people like Daniel have been some of the leaders in creating this open uh, data set of non-human primate imaging data. So I'd really recommend going and, and playing around with that. Now, I, I think another question in the chat was about, was this anesthetized or, um, or awake data? And uh, there is both anesthetized and awake data in um, this open prime data set. And uh, Ting has 
done this analysis with both anesthetized and awake data. And you can check out her paper with lots of collaborators, probably many of you who are here uh, in your image in 2020. I think it's a really lovely paper that you can dig into the details on. Cool. Um, so um, I guess the questions have all been answered in the chat. Uh, does anyone else want to raise up any points or anything? Can I ask a question to Casey? Um, Go for it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, your talk was also lovely, really like fantastic uh, study. Uh, I, I, I was just wondering whether you uh, know the study from recent study from the Gustav Deco, where he checked uh, the kind of hypothesis about um, global work workspace theory, which which is related to consciousness access. Uh, when I saw your talk, um, I wonder those within this DMN, those area that is really inside, is it much closer to conscious access or, or more important to make the conscious access or not? So, so how Gustav Deco checked this hypothesis was uh, calculating which club connectivity for the functional connectivity, not the structural connectivity. And then it turns out that those um, rich club areas are related to um, some conscious acts. Uh, the paper the paper is published in Nature Human Behavior, and then yeah. I, I I thought I, I feel that uh, you may want to check this uh, and uh, within this DMN, which area is more important to this conscious access? Yeah, I, I I kind of forgot that I read that paper actually. As soon as you said global workspace, it made me think like whether the is it that the areas of the default mode that are receiving all this information are having conscious access or the ones that are more removed? And I, I don't know if I really have ever worked out how to judge what conscious access is, though. Um, so, yeah, like it may, it may be related to your functional rich club, but I, I, I don't see how that's a leap to... Um, to conscious access. What I do know is that the outside part of the default mode, so the areas that are more on the border and like away from the limbus are the ones that are receiving the most information. Um, but then it's also different to the ones that are sending information. So, so the, the functional the rich club, I would assume is something like um, which areas like echo the most other areas you know the, the the paper basically the message with the of the paper was the moment that we feel this consciousness access is the moment that those one of the rich club nodes to start to propagate the information to other rich club nodes okay so, so when i listen to your talk um whether those um outside of default mode network play a role of this propagating the information uh, across different rich club or inside. So mm. um, so the, the communication within the default mode was quite odd, actually. I didn't show any of those results, but the um, uh, connectivity both based on like the navigation efficiency and afferent and efferent connectivity didn't follow either the outside ingredient or the structural model within the default mode. So I. I would have to kind of use another data-driven method, I think, to understand communication within the default mode because it didn't fit with the two more hypothesis-driven um, ideas that we had, either that um, that it's going along the sensory fugal hierarchy once it gets into the default mode. We don't find evidence for that. Like, it, it skips all over the place. Um, and we also don't find that it's organized by the outside in. Um, I think there's... Yeah, there's a different form of connectivity within the default mode that isn't revealed by the two axes that I was showing actually. 
So uh, I think I think this is a really interesting kind of line of question and uh, suction. And although my intention when I started in neuroscience was always to avoid consciousness, uh, unfortunately I've been dragged in somehow. And uh, we're, we're kind of working on a, a model, like a large scale dynamical model, kind of based on the connectome of of access to consciousness. Where I mentioned it in the slide in, in my talk with a, a really great um, young researcher called Elise Klatzman and. And Xie Jing Wang and Stanislas Dan. And actually, we're thinking not so much of the moment of access to consciousness as when it reaches the default mode network, but maybe more like when it reaches something like what we call like the, the frontal parietal network or, or central executive network and so on. Um, so that's just how we're thinking of it. I think another thing to take into account is that, at least in that theory, it doesn't, when you go down to the level of neurons, it doesn't have to be a stationary set. Of neurons, it just has to be this large scale distributed pattern of activity that can integrate um, information or share information across large parts of the brain. So it could be the case that, you know, it's, it's initially or mostly involved in uh, communication, say th from sensory areas through the dorsal attention network to, to frontal parietal or central executive network um, but maybe in other occasions that there's more of a, a contribution of the default mode network um, that's how i think uh, i'm thinking of it at least uh, I, okay oh go ahead yeah i have maybe like one question that's like um also to suk jun initially but then maybe also like a little bit more general about the session uh, Sukjun, in your in your talk, you showed like these beautiful uh, simul biophysical simulation associations, but you mentioned that you know you worked mainly at the group level, and it was challenging to to make them work at the individual subject level. And I, I'm sure, like the people who do the simulations, they get this question these questions like all the time. Um, what is like a good way to to make these models work at single subject? at single subject level and then also do we generally need to build biophysical models to actually be able to bridge across scales or is like just a spin test correlation um, sufficient to do this that is like hardest question <laughs> which i'm not sure that i can answer for. um let, but i i can answer with respect to my experience for the um, individual um, modeling uh, it, first of all, m my experience was I I never really found a stable um, model optimization reserve whenever whenever I work on the individual. So um, depending on the slightly different parameter set, uh, the your your um, model signals is fluctuating uh, here and there. So that it's the, in terms of stability, it's not so great when you work on the um, individuals. Um, so I don't know, I, I cannot really answer what is the really best way to do this individual. Maybe Thomas has, has the answer for this. <laughs> yeah, actually, I'm curious when you say that you, you're having trouble, like, like, what do you mean? So you're saying that if you run the model, when you run the Dermitas uh, model twice, the opt his optimization twice, you get two different results or, or what? Yeah. So when I set up a certain parameter for the model and then get the result and then I have some sense how I should change the parameters so that I, I reach to my goal. But then if I change slightly some value the parameter, like uh, excited, like so, some values, then the the model dynamics is completely different. <laughs> so that I cannot so, really so, yeah. so so first of all, these kind of models are very nonlinear. So uh so a slight change in the model parameters could lead to a uh, big change in, in the dynamics. So my question is that you are, you, when you say that you have a sense of how to change the parameter values, um, I thought the Demitas papers, um, they do this by Bayesian optimization approach, right? You're, you're, tu you're tuning the model manually or well, you're actually uh, using the optimization? There, there are some free parameters that automatically should be optimized, but there, there are also uh, several hyper parameters that I set up. Ah. Like as, as you know, there are some special parameters that are. Yeah, but the, you recently published in BioArchive paper that you now use two objective functions. One is like functional gradient, and the other I don't I I, I don't clearly remember. But when I right. take object function or the other object function, the dynamics completely different. So that I can really summarize. Yeah. 
So <laughs> the other thing is that there's definitely a degeneracy in the model, uh, in, in some of the model parameters. So you might need to constrain this. Uh, we can talk further. I feel like we're going too much in details now, but you might want to constrain the sign of um, some of the parameters. Yeah. Because, uh, uh, um, in, I mean, John John told me as well that uh, that he didn't really harp on it in his paper, but um, in the Dermita's paper, but th there is some degeneracy in some of the parameters. So like a positive value, if you flip it to a negative value, it might work just as well. Yeah. So that could also add to your uh, issues. Yeah, we, we, can, we can have a chat further. Yeah. Oh, you can ask John. <laughs> So I, I think that one, I think that a lot of the focus in the large scale modeling uh, has been on trying to explain resting state functional connectivity patterns. And that's great, right? But maybe you might be able to figure out a solution if you also try to uh, explain other things as well as resting state functional connectivity, right? So what might be, you might get an equally good solution if you have very strong recurrent excitation uh, in the sensory areas as if you have very strong recurrent excitation in the, in the um, prefrontal areas, for example. But those two solutions might not be as good as each other if you're trying to explain working memory or, or some attention task or some other things. So, um, I, you know, I think it's, it's, it's worth trying to uh, also think about Diff, trying to explain different things with the same model. So for example, so you have this really cool data on intrinsic timescales, right? I mean, are you able to, instead of just trying to explain the rest and state functional connectivity patterns, also explain the intrinsic timescales with the same model, right? That might give a solution. And actually, I might bring this back to a question for Sukjan because, you know, initially a paper from, from our lab that I wasn't involved in from Rishi Chowdhury back in Euron in 2015, they came up with a model that explained this variation in intrinsic timescales. And they actually suggested that the increase in intrinsic timescales, now this is meant to be neural activity, not bold activity. So there could be some difference there, but they suggested that this increase in intrinsic timescales was associated with an increase in recurrent activity along the cortical hierarchy. Now, if I remember correctly, you found, um, you found, a longer intrinsic time scale in V1 in people with autism. Is that right? No, a shorter, a shorter intrinsic time scale in V1 in people with autism and a longer intrinsic time scale is somewhere in prefrontal cortex. But then when you fit the model parameters, you actually found a stronger recurrent excitation in V1 in the, in the autism group. Now that's possible, but it would seem to go against the Chowdhury model, but maybe the, the, the reason this is, is is because of some difference in the long range connectivity, or maybe there's some other explanation. But if you try to explain both the long range connectivity and the intrinsic timescales in the same model, I wonder, would you come to the same conclusion? You point out really good, uh, important points. Um, for me, what is what is the, uh, the already problematic is, I, I, I always wonder what is the, optimal structural connectivity that give you long range um, connectivity. And then depending on what kind of structural connectivity configuration you use for as a backbone for your model, again, the para optimized parameters is also will be changed. So yeah, there are many factors that can affect it. Um, also, I just want to just ask, maybe I don't think I have an answer, but just touch on Boris's question or point that, you know, should we be doing uh, modeling, uh, dynamical modeling, or should we just be doing spin test correlations? And I think it depends what your question is, right? Or what your goal is. I think there's obviously a lot of value in spin test correlations. We've seen that from many people here, but, you know, I don't think it always gives you the answer, right? Um, for all of the questions. So for example, if we see a difference in the intrinsic time scale, uh, you know, across the cortex, and we see that the intrinsic time scale correlates strongly with myelin, or T1, T2 weighted signal, for example, right? Does that mean that that uh, is because of changes in cortical myelin? Well, I think that if you collaborate with anatomists and physiologists and you try to think carefully about your modeling, well, maybe modeling can kind of try to provide answers there. So I think that there's a place for both. And I think it depends on what your goal is. Um, Thanks. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I kind of agree with um, Sean's point about that. Yeah. Um, but um, let us move on to uh, more um, other, so other people have a chance to ask questions. 
Um, so um, Mikhail did raise his hand, but I believe that there were other questions in the chat that came in earlier. So let's try not to neglect those in the chat as well. Um, I think Daniel has a quick question for you, uh, Sean. How much of your variance was explained by, by your first PCA, mostly for MPA and MMDA, NMDA? Right, so the first PCA was completely dominant in the receptor um, per neuron data. It was uh, almost 80% of the variance. And uh, this is uh, really not, I, don't, I wasn't sure, I don't think I understand the AMP NMDA bit because this first PCA actually had contributions from all of the receptors. And this is why you see this extremely strong correlation uh, with the total number of receptors per neuron across all the receptors. So this is essentially the way I see this, and maybe you can read the preprint if you're interested, is we also see this increase in the size of the dendrites of, of the pyramidal cells as you go up this gradient uh, that fits really well. So I think you see these pyramidal cells with big dendrites and they have all types of receptors. And then it's once you get into the second, third, fourth, fifth principal component, it's where you start to get interesting patterns of, of different, uh, different receptors expressed across cortical areas. Okay. Um, so uh, now, Sophie's, um, oh, yeah, so go ahead, Thomas. I think Sophie's had her hand up for a while and then, uh, but. No, yeah, so I I lo no worries. You can also go for the chat. I just got a like tired arm from raising my arm. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but um, do you want to go first for the chat or shall I ask? No, I, Sophie can go first, followed by Kersia in the chat, and then Mikhail. How about that? Okay, so um, yeah, first of all, thanks for your amazing talks and works, uh, and um, yeah, very very cool. So I have a more like broader question because also Casey mentioned at some point breaking the structural model a little bit, and like, and my question is also like thinking of things in the brain that break the structural model. I was also thinking about the cerebellum, for example. Uh, in, in showing little like sartre architectural variation and like, and then thinking further also about what these like hierarchies or heterarchies mean, like, do you think this is like more of a mirror reflection or whatever happens outside of the cortex? So in the end, what does it, maybe this is a too general question, but like, what do you guys, does it represent? Is it an answer or just a mirror image of something that's happened somewhere else ultimately? like I beyond think, the cortex. I can give it a go. Yeah, um, Casey, this is a question <laughs> for you. <laughs> um, so I think that, I, I don't think these are mirror images by any means of what's happening in the subcortex. I think that would make them extremely redundant. Um, so speaking, for example, of the default mode, I think that we see such expansion there. Um, because of the uniqueness that it offers relative to what's already happening and that it can pick up on um, aspects of processing that aren't being used in subcortical areas. Like obviously like Max really nice work on what that really wonderful review about the cerebellum kind of picking up um, kind of the slack and doing a lot of automating for the cortex for the rest of the brain. And then so you can have other types of combinations in these different networks. That's how I tend to think of them. They're, they're all providing these like complementary ways of recombining data, either based on different types of input data or the way that the data is recombined. But I don't think that they're just mirror images of subcortex. And maybe also the same question of for CEO, like that, like, do you think that what you see in, in, in ASD, like, is this a cortical issue or like something that is beyond? Um, yeah, because in my study, uh, I should have actually included subcortical structures, but unfortunately I didn't. So I, I have, I, I don't have like a clear answer for that, but uh, to me, it's always a mixture of between sub subcortical structures and the development of sensory uh, and networks at the initial developmental phase. Mm -hmm. And you know, as as the aging is ongoing, the those effect from the either from stru uh, subcortical structures or sensory ne sensory network is gradually accumulating to give effect to the high order areas. So in the end, I, I think it's probably both, but in my study, 
I didn't include the stock critical structure, so I cannot really answer as evidence based. And yeah, maybe also then I'm finished. But like I was also like you mentioned also the word hierarchy and like do you in higher order regions? But can we really speak about higher order regions and like like not like can we really see it in this more hierarchical way or like how how to like obviously it's a system right and it's organized in some way but can we really prioritize like one system like the default mode as seeing as seating at the top of cognition because in some sense Casey's argument is a little bit because it integrates so many different cortical types right at least that's something that makes it special I guess or at least that's your point but can we really say that one is well, not better, but like, how can we then speak about the system if there's not, not a beginning and an end, right? It would be so nice to have it as a seed of cognition sitting there with the crown being the default mode or like in some way, but like, how do you maybe also see, because you mentioned the word hierarchy at some point, that's why I also had to think about this with relation to the subcortex and, and sensory region, so. Am, am I, am I the one should answer the question or? No, Sean, uh, Sean, or you? Oh, I, I right, sorry. You. Because you yeah. mentioned hierarchy, uh, so that's why. Yeah, I yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay. Um, I like the idea of maybe we can all get together and decide what the best network is. Um, my vote is is the default mode. I think Casey's agreeing, or maybe Daniel. Um, yeah, so uh, so we define the hierarchy in a, a by looking at patterns of retrograde track tracing data. So feed forward connections, so from V1 to V2 and V1 to V4 and so on, they tend to come from the superficial layers um, and the feedback connections in the other way, they tend to come from the deep layers. And uh, if you kind of, you can put together a, a model then to predict the hierarchy of all of the areas that you have this retrograde tracing data for. So what I was correlating with, in, you know, when I plotted the hierarchy, it was just this uh, prediction based on the laminar pattern of connections. But what you mm -hmm. actually see, I mean, for a start, I don't really think that the cortex is like, you know, best described in, in a line. You know, it, it, we have a, an updated version of a, a paper um, based focus on dopamine and working memory, where we show at least an updated version of a two dimensional hierarchy, uh, similar to stuff that Daniel's published and, and, and so on. Um, so what I will say is that it's pretty, this method is based on the connectivity, but also if you look at the receptor data and so on, and most of the data I've looked at, it's pretty easy to separate early sensory hierarchies like V1, V2, V4, also in somatosensory cortex are pretty good. Once you get into like areas that we would consider part of the like higher cognitive networks, the hierarchies based on these like data driven methods that I've used tend to be a lot flatter. And I'd have a lot less confidence in saying that, um, you know, area 9 slash 46D is above area 46D or, or, or so on. Uh, I think that's one of the nice things about Daniel's uh, and colleagues gradient papers is that it brings a bit of order into these higher cognitive networks. Um, but a lot of the anatomical data that I've looked at in the monkey, we don't maybe have uh, in the connectivity, for example, complete mapping of the higher cognitive network. So I don't want to make any kind of strong statements there. Great yeah. yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, no, I think it's, yeah, I, I think a lot about hierarchy since I'm a group leader uh, and about how to like make organizations work, uh, like having a flat hierarchy, because it's also, I guess, imagine like not for my group leader in skills, but like in the brain, uh, tricky if you have no hierarchy, how to organize it then, right? Because you like, there has to be something organizing, even if you don't have a hierarchy, I assume. but. Uh, I'll, I'll let, uh, I think, somebody else either in the chat or with the hands raised have a go. And thank you so much for the awesome work. Let's go with Kersia's question, and then uh, Mikhail will be probably the last uh, question. Um, Kersia asks, uh, oh, I mean, Shokju, I guess you can read, read yourself, I guess. Um, he or she is asking um, how intrinsic Neural time scale is calculated. Is it consistent with the work by Watanabe? I just checked the paper uh, to to compare. I, I should have checked this first, but now I found this. 
uh, it is shorter. The, the what 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 Tanabe found was shorter than what I found. Uh, like my my finding on intrinsic time scale is like from two to four or some things. To me, it's always um, remind me that it's related to the um, um, echo, uh, repeated repetition time of fMRI TL time, um, and also. Uh, so it's, it's not clearly represent the only neural activity, but it's sort of hemodynamically coupled uh, uh, signals. And then, uh, so, so this is bold, uh, bold dependent intrinsic time, time scale. And another one is uh, how you calculate this intrinsic time scale is also matter because I used the, what um, I think John Murray used, like a, those uh, um, DK um, length. But what Watanabe used is rather calculating the under the area curve of this auto auto correlation function. So depending on what kind of measure you use, uh, it also could be different. So, yeah. Okay, uh, we've got a couple minutes left. Uh, Michal, would you like to jump in with your question? Yeah. Hear me? There we go. Yes. All right. Um, so I've got a more methodological question about the diffusion embedding technique. So uh, if you use the fusion embedding, you need to adjust the two parameters, the alpha parameter and the diffusion time parameter, or the other uh, called the scale parameter. So my first question is how to adjust uh, how to adjust them optimally uh, or uh, can I just stick with the default values from the script that were probably used um, and the second question is uh, mm, concerning the input matrix to the diffusion embedding technique the affinity matrix um, I noticed that instead of putting the connectivity matrix uh, 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 there is an additional line of code where you calculate a cosine similarity, right? like the product of this uh, uh, connectivity matrix. Mm, and I wonder why, why we cannot just plug the simple connectivity matrix instead. So two questions, so alpha time and the matrix. Thank you. Maybe like, the, I think it, more generally, if we may, and then of course, I think during there'll be plenty of time today to talk about different methods and comparison, but more generally guys, any of the folks who spoke just now on the panel, what are your uh, thoughts regarding the impact of different analytic techniques? Obviously we're early on in, in this kind of field and application. And so there's a lot of space for um, methods comparison. Um, are there any insights you've had regarding the impact of these various parameters on your analyses or how to best optimize for the selection? Um, so, uh, there are many important points that we should discuss. Just to answer his question first, um, I'm not sure uh, I, I know the, all, all of two parameters that you said, but one of them, if I know correctly, is about, um, is related to how, uh, how much you measure the, the global effect of your um, the, the data structure that you you want to um, you want to reduce the demand. For instance, if you use um, a certain value for the the parameter that I'm referring now, uh, you rather uh, take uh, consider more um, direct connectivity configuration. Whereas if you increase that parameter, you 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 take care of much um, uh, second or third order of connectivity, so that you mm -hmm. wanna. You want to reduce the dimension, taking into account of this uh, of, uh, far uh, fetching information in, in across the networks. So it's, it's, it's probably it's, the alpha parameter. It's it, yeah. it it's yeah it's it, yeah it makes sense. It makes total so it, sense. It, yeah, right. It, it, it depends on how much you care of this global topology, or you rather take care of the direct um, um, neighbor connectivity configuration. Right? So more like direct means closer and more like distant. Like 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 the waiting. 
first order neighboring, like a direct connectivity from functional. Uh -huh. Or you, if you want to take take care of uh, what is the neighborhood that I could uh, uh, visit through a multiple step, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. So you wanna take into account if you wanna take into account a more global um, um, overarching um, um, framework, then you wanna increase that parameter or decrease. I, I'm not sure which direction mm -hmm. you should, use, but it's related mm -hmm. to that aspect, I think. Mm. Uh, so I think that's that's more like like to the diff diffusion time related because yeah, diffusion yeah. times is um, making the scale of the data. How much uh, mm, the more the more diffusion time, the less clusters you get. Something like this. I think so. so. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your insight. Yes. I think when you um, when you use similar approaches to simulate functional connectivity from structural connectivity, as you increase diffusion time, um, your your proxies become more and more polysynaptic. Perhaps that's like a, a good analogy for is that it's like not the direct path, but you you really make the networks. You know, you, you get something that looks closer to a, to a default mode network actually um, than from diffusion MRI per se. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I think Sukjun has also done a, a, a cool study, uh, Sukjun, where you evaluated uh, um, the reproducibility right. of like all these different algorithms, and you also played around with using the time series uh, versus the connectivity or the affinity matrices directly. That's published in your image from last year. Mm -hmm. Oh, so I, I would love to see this paper. I'm gonna I'm gonna put in the chat, but um, there are there could be many ways to judge uh, which algorithm or which combination of parameter would give you uh, you know optimal reserve for the date uh, uh, dimension until reduction. But you know optimal is already like somehow operational definition depending on your goal. Um, mm -hmm. But my study, how I checked the optimality was three uh, different condition. One is reproducibility. Uh, reliability and predictive validity. So, like I, I made the study uh, to try to um, um, uh, give you uh, the guidance what what kind of combination of parameter you should use to to expect the gradient. First. And then um, I use I, I check these three conditions. And then, um, but I, I don't say only these three conditions are the condition that you have to think about. But uh, as a as a basic set. Uh, to develop a robust biomarker using this gradient. Uh, these are, I believe, the three uh, basic conditions. So, mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Um, do we still have a time to answer the question about this connectivity matrix versus... So I asked the question about why, won't, why don't we do the do fusion embedding on the connectivity matrix, but we need to do another process of this matrix to get the cosine affinity mat matrix. So uh, again, I mean, I'm sorry if I take all the time for to answer this question. Um, so in that paper that I referred, uh, that I, that I uh, published uh, last year, uh, what I what I also evaluated was whether when I use the directly time series as input or mm -hmm. uh, um, or functional connectivity, or after calculating similarity network, and then input. What 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 is the optimal way to prepare this input? Uh, is also mm -hmm. uh, can be evaluated by these three conditions. So indeed, in that paper, I checked these three conditions whether All right. using this time series give you a higher reproducibility, higher reliability, or higher prediction power. Then uh, turns out that. Um, doesn't really matter, but it's more real, um, 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 imperative condition how much you stretch your connectivity metric. Mm -hmm. and, and, and without particular reason why you want to use nonlinear dimensional reduction, at least in my study, it turns out that the PCA is the actually sim simplest way is giving you the higher reproducibility, reliability, and prediction power compared to mm -hmm. other nonlinear techniques. Mm -hmm. So yeah. That's okay. <laughs> I'll definitely to check it out. Thank you very much for your insights.
Okay, um, we are running um, five minutes over. Uh, Lorenzo, I'm sorry, um, but we'll probably stop right here. Um, perhaps you can ask your question um, in the chat. Um, and I'm going to hand it over back to Daniel, and I'm going to hand it over back to Casey. Yes, I will take it. Thank you so much for running that session, Thomas and Daniel. That was really nice. And yeah, Lorenzo, please feel free to put your um, question in the chat. And if there's any leftover questions, many of us might still be around in the social at the end of the day as well. Um, or you can strike up conversation because you, you know us all now. Um, okay, so that means that we have very quick little interim, which is going to be um, Gradients Trivia. So if someone, I think Richard, could you drop the um, the link for the form into the chat for me? Be my co-host. Thank you, Richard. Okay, is everyone ready? So all you have to do is click on that form and play along. It's gonna be really fun and quite short. So. Um, we really want to see uh, who who knows their gradients, um, and we'll we'll crown a champion by the end of the day. Okay, so just uh, click the form. If there's any issues, let me know now. Otherwise, I'll power along. So the idea is that it's just a pretty typical trivia. I'm going to read out questions. Um, there'll be three questions per section, four sections in total, I think, and you just write into the form your answer. Some are multiple choice, and some are long answer. Um, but because it's like a typical trivia thing, and I know you have your computer right there, but you know, I'll trust you that you're not going to Google anything. And that's also why the, the questions aren't on the sheet. So you can't just copy and paste anything and be sneaky. Okay, are we ready? Someone give me a thumbs up. Has anyone managed to access the form? Yes, thank you. Okay, first round. Round one, how many years has the Gradient Workshop been running? Starting off easy, okay. Oh, this one, this one's great because if you were paying any attention just then, you should know the answer number two. What procedure is typically performed on a functional connectivity matrix to identify gradients? I'll take a range of answers here, but th there's a couple of obvious ones from the first talks, right? Question three, fill in the gaps of the famed 1998 article by Marcel Meslem from blank to blank. Just fill in, what are those two words? From what to what? Okay, well done. You made it through round one. Now we are moving on to if I can move my slide, here we go. Is that the next round? Yes, that is. The next round is, no, you're a neuroanatomist. Um, so we have six different neuroanatomists here who are your multiple choice answers. They are Corbini and Broadman, Franz Gall, Paul Flessig, Cecile Vott, Oscar Vott, and Constantine von Economo. So for each of these questions, you have to choose which of those neuroanatomists fits the question, okay? So question four. Who had their habilitation thesis, cytoarctectonic parcellation of the cerebral cortex in prosimians, rejected by the University of Berlin? The habilitation thesis was rejected, this famous neuroanatomist. Okay, question five. Who undertook a lecture tour of Europe um, espousing a theory's organology using pet monkeys and human skulls as props. So who espoused a theory of organology? Okay, last one for the round. Which Milo architecture expert described the boundaries between areas as Haarschaf Grenzen, sharp as a hair? I'm sorry for butchering that German. So who described boundaries between areas as sharp as a hair? Okay, next round, we have a picture round. All you have to do is name the first author and the year of publication for each of these famous gradients. So you get one point for naming the first author and you get one point if you can also name the correct year 
but I'll give you half a point if you can get it within five years. So that is questions seven, eight, and nine. I'll give you a few seconds. Okay, hopefully you, you have at least the ideas in your head. Or take a screenshot quickly if, um, if you want to ponder it for a little bit more. Or I can leave it up at the end as well. So let's move on to the final round. It might get a little bit harder, I warn you. But it's multiple choice. Um, so which of these regions is identified as an origin in the dual origin theory? Is it the olfactory cortex? primary visual cortex, primary motor cortex. Which one is an origin in the dual origin theory? Okay, and 11. Which mammal doesn't have a corpus callosum? Is it a whale, a platypus, or a sloth? Which one doesn't have a corpus callosum? Okay, final one. The natural coordinate system of the central nervous system proposed by Rudolf Neuenhaus and Louis Puertz is based on what? Is it evolution, development, or connectivity? Sorry, can you repeat the question, please? Question 12? Sure. Yes. The natural coordinate system of the central nervous system proposed by Rudolf Neuenhaus and Louis Puels is based on what? Evolution, development, or connectivity? It's the natural coordinate system doing? of the CNS. I think it's uh, evolution of the human race. So just enter your answers on the Google form. We'll, we'll find out after... Um, the next session, I'll quickly mark all the paper, all the papers. I'm not teaching right now. I'll quickly um, mark all the quizzes, and we'll see okay, who. Okay, sorry, um, babes. Who who knows uh, the gradients the best? Okay, so with that, that's our little grading quiz. Um, I hope it, it made you think about some neuroanatomy, <laughs> and it wasn't Thank too you. hard. Can I? Uh, you got WhatsApp? Okay, so what we're going to do is take a seven minute break roughly and come back and return here at 10 a.m. And then we'll get started with session two, which will be chaired by Boris and Ben. Okay, thanks everyone.